Chapter 12 First Fruits The first fruits belonged to God and were taken to the house of the Lord. They were to be the best produce of the land and were to be used by the priest and his family. It was to be the first fruits of a man's labor that he was to deliver to the house of the Lord. Exodus 23, 16 through 19, 34, 26, Numbers 18, 8 through 13, Deuteronomy 18, 3 through 4. This means, in essence, that a man could not use the results or rewards of his labor until he had made an offering of a portion of them to God. Since a man could not use his harvest or income prior to his offering of the first fruits from it, this meant he did not own his income. What a man owns, he controls, and vice versa. Ownership is meaningless if a person cannot control the use of what he owns. Hence, the payment of the first fruits signified that a man did not own his income, but that God did. Also, because man cannot live apart from having an income in order to purchase the necessities of life, it can be understood that whoever owns a man's income owns that man's life. Thus, we can understand that God's tax of the first fruits reinforced the juridical principle of his ownership and control over man and his blessings. It impressed upon the mind of man that God was Lord. Moreover, the payment of this tax reinforced upon the heart and mind of man the understanding that all his life and all his blessings were free gifts of God. This can be seen from God's essence and from his ownership of a man's life and income. God's essence and man's essence are not the same. God is eternal Lord and man is temporal creature. God is totally self-contained and self-conscious and the creator of man and his world. Since God is totally self-contained and man is his creation, God has no necessity for what man may have. God has no need to trade or sell his blessing of life and income to man. Man, then, cannot purchase by his own efforts or works any favor of the Lord's. God owns a man's life and income, yet he is not compelled by any necessity to grant either to man. However, God does grant both to man. But these grants of life and blessing are free gifts of God. From this, we can understand that the tax of the first fruits is to reinforce the legal principle that God is Lord. Since God is Lord, he is the creator-owner of man, and thus is man's sole source of the free gifts of life and its multitude of blessings. The tax of the first fruits on a man's productive efforts establishes the principle that man is owned, lock, stock, and barrel, by God. It establishes the absolute premise that man is a dependent creature of the Lord, being dependent for even the sustaining of life. For this reason, Scripture does not specify a fixed amount that must be offered as the first fruits. The first fruits are required by God's word, but the amount to be given is a free will offering. If God had established a fixed amount for this tax, sinful man would have reasoned that payment of such a fixed amount would have entitled him to God's favor. But by not fixing the amount to be paid, God prevented a sum from being established in the mind of man as to what would be adequate for the purchase of his blessings. Because a man can never consistently give to God all of his income as a first fruit offering, since he must retain some funds to live on, he can never give enough to satisfy his desire to purchase the favor of God. He can never say in his heart that his available funds are sufficient for the task of purchasing the blessing of the Lord. He knows that he could always give more, since he has not given all to God. This lack of a fixed amount for the tax of the first fruits helps to destroy the reprobate belief that man can obtain the favor of, the, of God by works. The purpose of the tax of the first fruits is to establish a principle in the mind of man. It is not to get man to adhere to external rules through which he may attempt to buy the blessings of the Lord. For man to establish a fixed amount for this tax, as the Jews did, is an attempt on the part of man to destroy the principle of lordship that is incorporated in this tax. It is an attempt by man to legislate the means by which he can obtain God's favor. For this reason, there is no fixed sum of first fruits that a man must render to God. The objective of this tax is to reinforce the juridical principle that Christ, and not man, is Lord. The payment of this tax impresses upon the heart and mind of man that God, and God alone, is the giver and sustainer of life and of all its blessings. The first fruits were to be the best of man's first productive efforts. Exodus 23:14 through 19, Numbers 18:8 through 14. 
They were to be paid once every year by the Israelites at the Feast of Weeks, Exodus 34:22. The payment of this tax was to impress upon their hearts and minds God's deliverance of them from Egypt and his gift of life and blessings, Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11. The first fruits were to reinforce the Israelites' conviction of faith that God was the Creator, Redeemer, and Lord of man. Since this tax represented God's total ownership of and control over man, it only had to be paid once annually. The tax of the first fruits was law in principle, and therefore represented all of man's productive labors for the whole year. As stated before, God's law is law in principle, and it is his revelation of himself to man. Because God does not change, neither can the principle of his work. The specific circumstances to which his law applies does, not, does change, but the principle of his word does not. For example, in Deuteronomy 25.4, God's law declares, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. Now, this law is for a specific example that we might learn a general principle. That principle is that the laborer is worthy of his reward, 1 Timothy 5.18. That because even the ox has a right to eat that which he has helped to produce, so do men have a right to the wages that they have earned. The principle is that the worker is not to be defrauded, but has a claim on those for whom he has worked. Once this principle is grasped, then we can apply it to situations other than that given in this law. We can see that defrauding anyone who works for us is a violation of the law of God. We can understand that the worker should work in the hope that he will receive his reward, including the worker for Christ, 1 Corinthians 9.9. 9. The principle of God's law does, does not change, but its application often does. Therefore, the belief that Christ's advent on the earth was to set aside the law of God so that it was no longer binding upon man is false. Christ's advent was to fulfill the law or word of God. Quote, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. Matthew fifteen seventeen. To fulfill means to establish, execute, or satisfy. Therefore, Christ is establishing, executing, and satisfying the juridical principles of God's law. Nowhere else is this fulfilling of the law or word of God more clearly seen than in the taxes that God has laid upon man. There are actually four offerings of the tax of firstfruits. All reveal clearly the fulfilling of God's law and principle by his Son. The first offering of this tax was done by the high priest on the first day of Passover. It was an offering of new ripened corn and of a lamb. Leviticus 23, 4-14 Christ was resurrected on the, on the day of this offering. He was and is the Passover lamb. The first fruits are represented of him, who is the first fruits of the new creation. 1 Corinthians 15, 20-23 Christ, as the high priest and mediator between God and man, offered himself to God as a sacrifice for and as the first fruits of the new Israel. Thus, we can understand that the Old Testament offerings of sacrifice and first fruits were established and executed by Christ. This aspect of the law of the first fruits was not set aside. It was permanently established in principle, since Christ is, for all eternity, the one who was sacrificed for and is, and is the first fruits of the new humanity. Moreover, the offering of the first, fru first fruits of the new corn represented the beginnings of the new harvest season and of new life. Christ's offering of himself, the resurrected new corn, established the beginnings of the harvest of the new creation. His resurrection marks the beginning and attests to the victory of the kingdom of God on earth. Therefore, we can understand that, in principle, the first offering of the first fruits has been fulfilled by the Christ of God. It has not been set aside, but is a permanent and eternal aspect of the word of God. It is as binding upon the new Israel today as it was upon ancient Israel. But now Christ is the high priest, and the sacrifice and firstfruits. The old priesthood has passed away that a new one can be established. Therefore, Christ and Christ alone is the mediator between God and man. The remaining offerings of the firstfruits were conducted on the Feast of Weeks, Leviticus 23, 15-21, Deuteronomy 16, 9-12. This feast day was also known as the Feast of Pentecost, since it occurred 50 days after Passover. It was on this 50th day from the first Passover that God established his covenant with Israel at Sinai. 
It was also on the fiftieth day, after the resurrection of Christ, at the Feast of Pentecost, that God established his covenant with the new Israel at Jerusalem. Acts 2, 1-4 In both cases, the establishment of God's covenant at Sinai and at Jerusalem, by the giving of the law and the Holy Ghost, signified the new harvest of God. When God made his covenant with old and new Israel, he established the principle that they were his. They were the results of his work and labors and represented his harvest among the children of men on earth. The harvest of God were those who had been redeemed by his work and who were members of his one covenant of grace and law. The Feast of Weeks was to commemorate this event. It celebrated the deliverance of the Israelites from the house of bondage, which was Egypt, and their harvest and ownership by God through his covenant. Deuteronomy 26, 1 through 11. The second offering of the first fruits of the year was conducted by the high priest. He was required to wave before God two loaves of leavened bread, which were the first fruits unto the Lord. Leviticus 23:17. This new bread was made from flour of the new harvest. The high priest was actually representative of Christ. The wave offering was the children of God's covenant, or harvest, who had been leavened by the Holy Ghost. We can appreciate the meaning of the wave offering if we remember that the redeemed in Christ are, quote, a kind of first fruits of his creation, James 1, 18, quote, unto God and to the Lamb, Revelation 14, 4, who are leavened with, quote, the first fruits of the Spirit, Romans 8, 23. Christ, it, Christ is the high priest who, on the Feast of Pentecost, filled the, the apostles with the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, 1 through 4, and thereby established his covenant with new Israel. The new Israel is Christ's new harvest, which he offered before the Lord as the first fruits leavened with the Holy Spirit. In principle, this second offering of the first fruits at the Feast of Weeks has not been set aside, but has been eternally affirmed. Christ is our high priest, and we are his leavened wave offering. This particular ceremony is no longer required on earth, since Christ has established it for all time before God's throne of grace. The juridical principle incorporated in this law has not changed, nor been negated. It has been eternally established or fulfilled through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. The third and fourth offerings of this tax were to be conducted by the Israelites themselves at the Feast of Weeks. Exodus 23, 14 through 19, 34, 23 through 26, Numbers 8, 8 through 14, Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12, 26, 1 through 11. They were to bring the best of their labors to the house of God for the third offering. The payment of this tax to the Lord was to commemorate his deliverance of them from Egypt. It was to celebrate the establishment of his covenant and their membership in it. The payment of this tax was to reinforce upon their minds God's free gift of deliverance from sin and death, and the restoration of their standing before God by their membership in his covenant. It was to impress upon their minds that their life and their blessings were free gifts of the Lord. For this reason, this third offering was to be paid to the house of God. The payment of this tax by taking it to the high priest forced the Israelites to see themselves in a covenantal relationship with the Lord. The high priest was their mediator before God, and the payment of this third offering by them forced them to recognize this relationship. They were not autonomous. They could not approach God except through Christ. They were owned by God because of his covenant with them. Hence, the payment of this tax to the house of God was to impress upon their minds the covenantal nature of their faith. They were God's possession because they were members of Christ's covenant. The fourth offering of the first fruits. Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12, 26, 1 through 11, is not described as such in Scripture. It is described as, quote, a tribute of a free will offering of thine hand, which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God, according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Deuteronomy 16, 10. It was to be given to the Lord, but not to the high priest or the house of God. It was to be given to the Lord by giving it to oneself and one's family, the stranger, the poor, and the Levite for the purpose of rejoicing before God. Verse 11. This fourth offering was to be a tribute to God for his work of salvation, the giving of new life, and of all its blessings. The Israelites were required to rejoice before God because such rejoicing testified to their recreation in him. The rejoicing was to impress upon their minds their deliverance, quote, from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Romans 8, 21. 
This fourth tax, or free will offering, was required by God to be used for rejoicing. God did so because nothing in all of creation can so indelibly inscribe a principle upon the heart and mind of man as joy can. This can be seen from the fact that what has brought man exceeding joy he will always attempt to keep or return to. That is why Christ has spoken to us, that his joy might remain with us, and that our joy might be full. John 15:11. It is this joy in Christ, above all else, that will make us cling to him in every circumstance. For this reason, the Israelites were required to make a sufficient freewill offering at the Feast of Weeks in order to rejoice in the Lord. Their exceeding joy was to, was to be their testimony before God and the world that they were the redeemer, redeemed in Christ and he was their Lord. As we have seen, the first and second offering of the first fruits has been fulfilled and permanently established by Christ. His role as high priest and his offerings of both himself and of his new harvest have established forever before God's throne the principles incorporated in the law of the first fruits. For this reason, the first and second offerings by an earthly priest of earthly first fruits are no longer required. But this is not true of the third and fourth offerings or taxes. These taxes were paid by the Israelites themselves. They were their their offerings before God, not the offerings of a high priest. Christ, being the high priest of the new Israel, performed the duties and obligations of the office of the high priest, but he did not perform the duties and obligations that fell upon the members of his co- of his covenant. Christ performed no act that removed the requirement for the payment of these taxes by the children of God. For this reason, these latter two offerings, or taxes, remain obligatory upon all those who claim to be members of the covenant of God. The payment of these taxes are their sign and seal that Christ is their Lord. The payment of the small taxes of the first fruits are extremely important. The size of the tax is not. What is, what is important are the principles that it reinforces upon the mind and the heart of the elect. It should always be remembered that man was not made for the law, but the law was made for man. Mark 2.27 It is God's word that is the revelation of God to man. Our salvation in Christ is for the purpose of reestablishing our relationship with God through Christ by obedience to his every word. Deuteronomy 8.3, Matthew 4.4 4. The payment of these two taxes is for our benefit, not God's. It is for the purpose of impressing upon man the legal limits of his thoughts and deeds. It is one of the primary means by which men are to learn to think and act in conformity to the word of God. Therefore, any failure to pay these two taxes for godly Christian reconstruction and for rejoicing before the Lord will weaken our conviction of faith in Christ as Lord and Redeemer. We who are the called in Christ must rejoice in our Lord as our Redeemer and establish His name as Lord in every area of life and thought. We cannot allow ourselves to become obstacles to Christ's fulfilling of the Word of God on earth. We must pay the taxes of the first fruits in order to strengthen our conviction of faith and our service to God. The tax of the first fruits is as binding upon covenantal man today as it was upon ancient Israel. The principles of this tax are, are first, that they are to be the first and best results of a man's productive labors. Second, the amount to be paid is to be a free will offering. Third, the, fir- the first portion is to be paid toward Christian service and reconstruction. And fourth, the second portion is to be used for rejoicing before the Lord. These principles, in turn, reinforce the Lordship of Christ by establishing him as the owner of man and making man see his life and its blessings as his free gifts, destroying the concept that man can purchase the favor of God, forcing man to see that his relationship with God is covenantal in nature and that he is not autonomous, and by requiring man to rejoice in Christ, it impresses upon his heart and mind the rec- recognition that Christ alone is the Redeemer of man. The legal principle of the tax of the first fruits is for the purpose of impressing upon the heart and mind of man the belief that God is both Lord and owner of man and his world.